Hello, I'm going to talk about a project I've been working on for the past six months with my colleague Claire Dross and an intern the last summer, Pierre Alexandre Bazin, about proving the correctness of the GNAT Light Runtime Library. Um, so, what is this uh, GNAT Runtime Library? That's what we called previously at the core the uh, zero footprint ZFP or Raven's Car SFP or CERT runtime. So now it's divided between the light runtime and a more uh, encompassing embedded runtime. And this light runtime is targeted at embedded platforms. So we have uh, 77 platforms supported right now. Most of them are bare metal with a variety of, uh, of chips, ARM, Leon, PowerPC, RISC-5, x86, and x86 64 bits. And sometimes uh, with an S on top, so like PyCoS or Vexworks. And the units of that runtime are ready for certification. So a subset of these have been already certified for use in various projects in avionics, in space, in railway, in automotive, subject to the uh, suitable certification uh, documents. So like DO 178 for avionics, ECSS for space, EN 5128 for uh, railway, and ISO 26262 for automotive. So you can say that uh, the units in that runtime have been subject to a uh, high degree of scrutiny uh, with uh, proper specifications put in place and test suites and reviews, et cetera. So you can build this, this runtime based on the project that you have available freely on GitHub in VB runtimes, uh, where it takes the sources from the GCC repository under the GNAT sources uh, subdirectory. So just to give you a tour quickly of these uh, units in the GNAT light runtime, uh, if I take the x86 64 bits version, because of course for each version you have different number of units, uh, and here it has 182 spec files. And I'm only counting the spec files here because um, some of them uh, are just spec files, but some of them are bodies, and some of them are uh, instantiations of generics. So uh, they, they have spec plus bodies, but uh, declared ju just as a spec file. Um, so uh, between all of these 182 files, you have, of course, support for the ADA standard library. So that's the A hyphen something uh, uh, files and the uh, I hyphen something files for interfaces. So you have here uh, carton string handling, you have some Nurex library, you have support for assertions and exceptions, uh, but the, in this uh, runtime, there's no propagation of exceptions. It's only local uh, or calling the last chance handler. And there's interfaces with C. You have also a little bit of the GNAT user library. So we have a, a few G dash something files. It's mostly for IO. Uh, and you have many files that deal with the support for um, features of the language. So the GNAT runtime library. So you have 140 S dash something files. And so here you have support for various attributes like uh, tick image, tick value, tick width, attributes of floating point numbers. Uh, you have support for arithmetic operations, uh, especially on fixed points and floats and exponentiations, including pointages and some numerics, <coughs> and support for tasking. So all of that. Now I'm going to talk about proof. So proof using the Spark tool. Uh, it's a formal verification tool doing two kinds of analysis, one called flow analysis and one called proof. And proof is the most involved where it asks uh, provers about the validity of some formulas which entail the correction of the code. And so here you can see very briefly a depiction of the architecture of the, of the Spark tool, where it starts from the uh, complete left uh, inside an editor uh, where you can see the code. Uh, and at the bottom, you can see here uh, some Spark codes, uh, say assigning a value 42 in uh, uh, index one of array A. And uh, through uh, some codes, part of it, which is shared with the compiler, so what I call the GNAT here, uh, we transform that code into a YML intermediate, for, from intermediate form. So that's this code in the middle, which represents the assignment on the left, and which is represented by this uh, question mark in the middle, uh, which uh, is the symbol of the Y3 platform. And this platform dedicated to proof of programs then generates formulas. So you can see an example of uh, a, a bit of a formula in this SMTLib syntax uh, on the bottom right. 
And, and these formulas are dispatched to various provers, in particular automatic provers like AltaGo, CVC4, and V3, which are all included in the Spark technology. Okay. So in Spark, we emphasize the fact that uh, proof is not an all or nothing uh, endeavor. So you can uh, start at some bottom level, which we call the stone level, where you have only the, the guarantees of having a better, uh, safer subset of the language. And then you can go up the scale here with the bronze level for checking uh, constraints of data and information flow and making sure that everything is initialized. Uh, silver level is about making sure that there are no runtime errors, uh, in particular no CWE in the codes. At the gold level, you can start proving uh, key integrity properties, whether it's they are related to safety or security. And at the plat platinum level, uh, you can prove fully functionally the, the code. And so typically, the platinum level is applied to a much smaller subset of the codes uh, than what uh, than where you can apply lower levels. And the main target usually is the silver level, so absence of containers. But here in this project, we're going to target this platinum level, so fully functionally describing the behavior and proving that the code uh, complies with this uh, specification. So first, a little motivating example for this project. And so we are going back to 2012 uh, when we were adding support for big integers in that, so uh, mathematical integers uh, inside the compiler. It was motivated by a feature in Spark to allow intermediate computations without overflows. So we do them uh, using full mathematical uh, possibilities uh, to ignore the possibility of overflows in, uh, in some proof. And the implementation was done by uh, the late great developer Robert DeWar, so founder of Ericor. And he used uh, GNU, GNU algorithm D for this uh, multi precision division. Uh, so you have uh, integers in a number of uh, um, uh, machine integers. So you have array of, in, of machine integers to represent large integers. And this algorithm is described in The Art of Computer Programming, Volume 2. Uh, so we use the second edition uh, from 1981, and this will have an import later. That's why I'm mentioning it here. Uh, at the time, so the reviewer told him that uh, in the code that he had written, there was a possible overflow in this large uh, piece of uh, code, this large expression. Uh, but Robert, knowing that uh, he had implemented the, the code from uh, Knuth's uh, book correctly, uh, and assuming that uh, the, I mean, the, the book was correct, uh, was not convinced by this possibility of an overflow and asked for an actual issue. So the re reviewer went back to the codes and finally came up with this uh, example. So uh, try this uh, long uh, multiplication division, which corresponds to uh, to uh, activating this expression uh, leading to an overflow. And indeed, Robert recognized that the true result was different from the uh, computation uh, in the codes uh, given by Knut. So what happened? Well, even the best, like uh, Knut and Robert DeWar, uh, can uh, get it wrong, especially when it uh, comes to these very low level details uh, related to possible uh, runtime errors, and especially when it comes to overflows. And uh, regarding this specific computation, in fact, the bug had been already fixed in an ERETA of volume two in 1995. So that's uh, this part here, this test, which needs to be done to prevent a possible overflow. But that's not the end of it. Uh, so uh, 10 years later, it was uh, this test was fixed again. So it, it was not uh, actually a, an equality that should be done here, but a greater or equal test. So hopefully after that, uh, we have a correct uh, description of the algorithm, algorithm that can be implemented without overflows. So that's what we did. But obviously, algorithm gets implemented in many places. And that was the case uh, in the GNAT compiler. So this algorithm was used in two other units. Uh, in this unit, uh, UNP for arbitrary present computation during the compilation. And in this other unit, uh, system that's uh, r 64 uh, to support fixed point arithmetic, because fixed points uh, are uh, represented internally by the compiler and integers with some scale. And so you, you need this kind of uh, computations. But obviously, no two, no two implementations are alike. There are different constraints uh, in the data that, that are represented. And so on the one side, we uh, fixed the computation in UNP, uh, although we couldn't find an, an obvious bug. 
uh, but the, the computation was, uh, was the one that could be fixed. Uh, in uh, system.rx64, the test was done differently, and so uh, we didn't find a bug, uh, so didn't apply the, uh, the fix, and hoped that it was okay. Now, fast forward to 2019. Uh, here we were, as we usually do at the core, um, doing a runtime certification uh, for space. And one of the external reviewers uh, looking at these uh, units uh, for fixed point supports, and in particular at algorithm D implemented in scale divide, uh, made the remark that we should increase comment frequency to a better implement, put to better understand the working in the working of the algorithm. So that led to a new internal review. And uh, during this internal review, we detected uh, two possible silent overflows in another related function, so double divide, and the missing exception, uh, so some case which should raise an exception, but here uh, was not doing it in the scale divide. So that's not good. Uh, that was not uh, so bad, in fact, because uh, uh, as I said, the overflows were, were silent, uh, uh, so we're doing the right thing in the end, and the, the missing exception was just on incorrect uh, input. Still, a colleague from the specification team uh, challenged us, the Spark team, to prove the, the unit. So uh, we uh, set, uh, set on doing that. Uh, and one week of work later, we got all the algorithms except this uh, scale divide implementing algorithm D, which was more complex, proved. Uh, so we tried to have a discussion with the specification team, but uh, priorities to, uh, took on, and uh, well, everyone moved on. Uh, until uh, recently, so uh, last year, during a summer internship, a very good intern, Pierre-Alexandre Bazin, updated the proof that we had done uh, uh, two years before, and finally proved this uh, scale divide implementation. And so now it, it has moved so it's in this new file as uh, Arizu, because it's a generic implementation now for 64 and 128 bits. Uh, so you have this uh, uh, big contract at first, but which is quite readable. So you can look at the past condition of scale divide. Indeed, it says that if you go to big integers, that's this conversion to big for all the values involved here, uh, the result R is really the, the remnants, the result of uh, the remnants of the uh, uh, multiplication of X times Y uh, divided by Z. And for Q, if you ignore rounding, uh, which is just a slightly more complex case, uh, the quotient Q is really the quotient of X time Y uh, in mathematics divided by Z. And the precaution is just to uh, uh, prevent an overflow during this computation. So great. Uh, that was proved. We were very happy uh, to learn that uh, finally our implementation that had been certified was indeed uh, provably correct. So we say, well, let's uh, go from there and prove everything. But uh, the runtime is not exactly in Spark. There are a lot of uses of uh, untyped memory for uh, many good reasons to handle the secondary stack, for array comparisons, for things that are not necessarily even uh, aligned, for also ports to uh, get to the tags of uh, objects dynamic types. Uh, for binding to C strings, so many reasons to use in ADA addresses, so type address, and doing unchecked conversions between address and the pointer types. And this is something that is not at all supported by the ownership system that we have in Spark, which is uh, uh, fully typed. Plus, not everything is not is provable. Uh, in these units, there are a lot of uh, support for uh, low-level floating point operations uh, for some uh, language attributes in ADA uh, regarding floats. Uh, there are also low-level support for uh, numerics, like trigonometry. Uh, there's things that do double arithmetic uh, for, for double uh, using floats, uh, so two floats for doing a double. So all that depends on the bit representation of floats. In particular, uh, it does overlay, overlays uh, between various types. Uh, it uses the uh, representation of NaN, not a number, and infinities, which are not in Spark, and it does complex floating point reasoning. So all these things, both at the model level for NaN and infinities uh, and overlays, and at the level of uh, reasoning about this uh, floating point computation, is not supported by provers. So uh, we cannot expect to uh, 
both specify these uh, functionalities in great detail and prove them mathematically in part. So we set out for something less ambitious. Let's prove everything that fits the Spark subset and uh, can be both expressed and proved. So let's prove all the Spark things. So uh, first example of that is the interface to C. So let's take uh, the unit interfaces dot C. Here we had to express uh, things in addition to what was in the unit, just to be able to specify some of uh, the functionalities. So uh, we add, for example, a ghost function C length ghost, which adds what it means uh, to, to have the length of a C string, which ends at the uh, null character. And then this ghost function can be used in contact uh, and it's it itself implemented and proved. Uh, so the proof makes heavy use of uh, advanced part features like loop invariance for loops to summarize the states uh, of a current iteration of a loop or relaxed initialization uh, for things that are locally uninitialized but are uh, progressively initialized inside the loop but all all of these uses are quite simple and i'm going to show you so here is the uh, this uh, c length ghost function and you can see that it's implemented here uh, with a simple loop to get to the point where uh, you have uh, uh, the null character and you have a loop invariance as you would expect to prove in spark when you have a loop to say that so far no uh, character uh, was found to be null and this uh, CLEX function can be used then uh, to uh, specify uh, other functions like uh, this uh, function uh, to ADA, which takes this carry and returns the string. Uh, because depending on, uh, on the value of this other uh, parameter trim null, it's going to do something different uh, up to the uh, null character or not. Uh, and again, in this uh, to ADA, uh, you will see a loop invariance. Uh, for loops to summarize the, the, the work done so far. Uh, and, and here, uh, something else is that when we declare a variable here without initializing it, an array, we can declare it with relaxed initialization. Uh, and then inside the loop, we need to uh, specify up to uh, which index uh, this array is initialized. And so proof is going to take care of approving initialization of this variable. If you don't, then it's done by flow analysis in a much more uh, a coarser way and uh, it cannot be applied here because the array is progressively initialized. Okay, uh, now let's uh, move on to uh, fixed point support. So uh, returning to uh, this uh, um, uh, scale divide and other uh, functionalities. So it's implemented here in these uh, various units, R832, R864, R double, so which is the generic instantiated uh, in R64, for example. Um, and here we take we took the comments in the code, uh, which were quite detailed, and translated them into Spark contracts. So you can see an example with this uh, adds with overflow check. Uh, so we have a function here uh, in in 64 range, which says when, when an argument uh, which is a, a big integer, so arbitrary uh, integer not bounded, is within the range of a sign uh, in 64. Uh, and so this is a ghost function again, so something that's only for specification and proof. And inside the function add with overflow check, now we can add a precondition that says uh, for this function to operate properly, it, it needs to uh, take arguments which won't overflow when you add them. So when you do the, the summation in uh, big integers, then it fits in the uh, sign uh, integer 64. Then the result will indeed be uh, the result of the addition. And so let's look at that. Uh, so in the uh, uh, integer 64 bits uh, uh, spec, it's here. And the, the implementation here it just renames the, uh, the generic. So let's look at the generic uh, spec and implementation. Uh, so that's just what we describe in terms of spec. Uh, and the implementation here uses a number of what we call uh, lemmas. So uh, uh, things, procedures that are ghosts, so only here for, for proof. Uh, which uh, prove a given property, the post condition, from another property given in precondition. So that's a way to isolate a proof so that the, the automatic provers can do it much more easily. Uh, so this proof can be quite involved, as you can see here. 
with a number of uh, uh, cases being uh, uh, described, uh, assertion to drive the provers, even some lemmas. So these lemmas are again uh, the same that as what I just showed, except they are more general. So I've extracted them here uh, in a, a different part of the file. Uh, and in the end, uh, the code uh, is not uh, uh, obstructed by the use of all these codes. We're just calling the lemmas where uh, they are needed uh, to prove the, the post condition in this case. So that's a rather simple case, in fact. So now if we turn to uh, the dreaded uh, scale divide, uh, this is much more complex because here we're mixing in sign integer arithmetic uh, unsigned, so modular integer arithmetic, and arbitrary uh, bounded uh, integer arithmetic with these big integers. And you can see that you have quite uh, big uh, uh, lemmas. And uh, uh, these uh, are also uh, proved with a more complex reasoning. And in the end, the implementation has to uh, call these lemmas at the, at the right places in the right order for the, the proof to go through automatically. So we have also approved uh, character and string handling. Uh, so for character, it's in uh, ADA characters that handling. Uh, and I have an example just at the bottom of the slide. And for string, that's the bonnet string, the fixed string, uh, and maps, uh, plus supporting units in that, uh, that implement part of these functionalities. And here the uh, the specification comes directly for from the ADA reference manual. So the description was translated into Spark contracts. An example, very simple example of that is this function is control in uh, characters handling. So it's specified as true if item is a control character, uh, and the control character is defined as the character whose position whose position is one in one of the ranges 0, 31 or 127, 159, and that's exactly what you have in the post condition here. The result of this uh, function call is whether the position of the uh, uh, item uh, argument is in these ranges. Easy. So uh, specification can be a bit more complex uh, for more involved functions. So for example, here in ADA strings fixed, you can see this function index, which is going to uh, look for a position of uh, a given pattern in a source string. And here, uh, well, the, the, there are many cases uh, described in the specification which uh, turn into these large uh, contract cases. So uh, we're using a special form of contracts, uh, which uh, gives, uh, depending on various cases here, before the row, the result that is expected uh, here. And so uh, here, this unit is in fact uh, based on another implementation in another units. And so this other uh, implementation has a similar contract and uh, it, it, its body is, is uh, verified against this contract. And here it calls uh, other uh, variants of index which are themselves uh, uh, proved against their specification. Uh, let's move now to uh, exponentiation. So there are various uh, implementation of exponentiation for sign integers, uh, modular integers, and uh, depending on the value of the modulo. Uh, so uh, for example, here you have the, the binomial modular is the simplest. So it's specified at, at the top here as just, well, uh, the exponentiation left ex uh, uh, at the exponent right. Uh, the sign version is a bit more complex because we need to make sure that there's no overflow. So it has a precondition. Uh, that uses this uh, computation in big integers. So we're doing the explanation big integers and checking that the result fits in the range. Uh, and the even more complex case is a modular uh, explanation with a non-binary modulus. So when the, the modulus is not two to power or something, uh, but can be uh, 42, say. And here, uh, the, the way to specify it is to say that uh, the results here, uh, x modular tick results, when considered as a big integer is really the operation done here in big integer modulo uh, the value of the modulus. So we have to do that because uh, just doing it in, uh, in modular uh, machine integers uh, would do a double modulo and would be incorrect. 
So if we look now at the code, uh, so as I said, uh, the simplest one is this uh, a modular uh, explanation, and and here it's a simple loop with, uh, as you would expect, a loop invariance and and uh, a few assertions. Uh, now, if you look at the uh, sign version, well, it's slightly more complex. So there are a number of lemmas uh, related, uh, relating uh, how the operation works in big integers, especially because exponential is, is more difficult to reason about with the automatic proofs. And so uh, the uh, the implementation also has more uh, ghost code to drive uh, the proof and calls to these lemmas to help proofs. And the most complex is this uh, uh, exponentiation uh, of a module type with a non-binary modulus, because here we have uh, uh, sign integers, unsigned integers, and uh, uh, and uh, exponentiation with the uh, big integers. And so we have uh, many more lemmas, and and uh, we have much more effort to drive the covers toward uh, and the net proof. I'd like to finish with the support for a tick image and tick value. So uh, uh, tick image is a way to print values uh, of various types, and tick values does the converse, so it takes a string and returns the value. Uh, and uh, the goal here uh, is to be able to uh, to show that the image and value function in the runtime are reverse functions. So uh, give a sufficiently precise post condition for value for the value function for type, so that the post condition of the corresponding image can state a value applied to the result of image of V uh, gives back V. So what, that's what we do here uh, in this uh, procedure image boolean in this code snippet. So you can see here at the bottom that indeed when we could value when we call value boolean uh, on the results S uh, string from one to P because P and S are, are the result of this procedure, it gives back V the input of the image boolean. Uh, and uh, we are in the process of doing that for all of the other types. Uh, so if we look now just at this, uh, I wanted to show the, the specification that is needed for this uh, uh, S value, uh, for, the, for this uh, value for unsigned integers. So uh, it's, uh, it's here. Oops. Yeah, scan and sign is one of the functions used here. And you can see that uh, it has a quite complex uh, post condition because we need to describe what happens with the blank characters uh, and uh, what happens with sign and the various ways to uh, to specify the value. Uh, and so it depends on all these uh, other uh, ghost functions that uh, describe uh, how the base and, and the uh, value uh, past the base are described and exponents, etc. So that's all for this project. So the current status uh, is that we managed to find a few mistakes uh, and uh, fix them. Uh, just uh, possible overflow and run checks. Uh, that was the good news. Uh, an example of that is this simple test. So uh, if you uh, compile this code, uh, well, uh, you will get an error, uh, but not necessarily the, the, the one you expect. So here we are. Uh, trying to get a Boolean value from the string, which just contains a blank character. So this is incorrect. And what you would expect, and you will get in the next uh, community version, uh, is this last line. A constraint error is raised because it's a bad input for uh, the uh, attributic value here. Well, uh, if you uh, use a Knet community with 2020 version or, or previous, you will get a segmentation fault, in fact. Uh, because underneath there's an overflow in the uh, runtime support code here, uh, and you end up uh, reading and writing uh, much past the, the string here. Uh, and this overflow happens, uh, as you would expect, because uh, the string of one character is uh, located with the index natural t class. So at the extreme uh, value of uh, possible indices here. Uh, say situation is slightly better with uh, the latest version of Net Community 2021 because here uh, instead of a segmentation fault you get you get a constant error, but not the one you would expect. In fact, uh, in this version of Net Community, the runtime was uh, compiled with runtime checks on, but not overflows. So the overflow is silent, but then you get uh, a runtime check failure when we're trying to uh, 
uh, access the array S beyond this bound. So you get this index check failed. So what we are with that, uh, we have a partial proof of the GNAT light runtime library. So for 35 units, uh, so that's not nothing, but that's uh, far from the uh, um, total number of units here. So uh, as I said, using the uh, x 664 version around 180 units. Um, the daily proof uh, takes one, one uh, hour and 30 minutes on a quite big server, so a 63 cores Linux server. And we do all the configurations that I mentioned here. Uh, so for ARM or uh, x86 uh, Linux uh, with VXWorks or bare metal. Uh, in total, we added many specifications uh, inside these units. So almost 400 preconditions, 500 post conditions. The proof also requires more uh, than just the specifications to drive the provers towards uh, proof. So what we call ghost code, which is not executed in the end, in particular because uh, inside these units, we specify that uh, ghost code should, should be ignored during the final compilation. So we have to add uh, almost 150 loop invariants, uh, almost 400 assertions, uh, and uh, almost 300 ghost entities, so types, variables, and many of these are actually lemmas. So 150 lemmas, that's what I showed you, ways to uh, prove a given property uh, in a smaller context uh, so that automatic provers can do it automatically. And that leaves us with two questions uh, for the future. Can this effort benefit the future specifications of the runtime uh, by adding more guarantees to what we can do today with uh, testing only? Uh, and also, what can we do Beyond what Spark supports currently, can we do something in particular for units that uh, use these uh, addresses and conversion to pointers that uh, currently are not supported? Well, uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm waiting for your questions. Don't you consider that having 60 plus lines of contracts for five lines of uh, for? OK, I'll continue. It seems you disconnected. So the question was, uh, do you consider that having 60 or plus lines of contract for a declaration in that, which is initially five lines, uh, is makes the specification unreadable? And so uh, initially, I, I, I uh, understood this question wrong. I thought he, he was talking about five lines body. And indeed, uh, there should be a relationship between the complexity of the function that you are trying to specify uh, and the specification. Uh, and then it depends how far you want to go in terms of specification. So here we went for the platinum level. We wanted to fully specify functionally uh, these, these functions. And so the fact that the function declaration in ADA is five lines is a bit irrelevant. It doesn't say uh, really the complexity of the function that you're trying to implement. You could have underneath uh, the wall a system that you're implementing or just a really small leaf function. And so that's where I think it matters. Uh, do you uh, learn something by specifying uh, this uh, larger contract, like these 60 lines of uh, contract? And so here, in, in this case, it was pointing at the index function, which I pointed at in my talk for uh, string manipulation. And the contract is actually quite readable. Uh, so it specifies exactly what these cases are in the index function. And if you don't write this as a form of contract, well, you have English uh, prose that you will find in the EDA reference manual, which is itself uh, usually not self-contained. So you have various paragraph of the uh, reference manual, which uh, end, end up defining the behavior of this function. So I, I think in the end, uh, so there are two, two answers. Uh, the contract should matter to you, so it should uh, say something interesting. Otherwise, just maybe don't do that. Uh, so this it relates also, also to the level at which you want to prove the code. Uh, and then in terms of uh, use of uh, uh, IDEs, I hope that in the future we have IDEs which allow to uh, hide these uh, contractual uh, uh, codes, like we hide the comments. And so that's something we've discussed, for example, for our future uh, support of uh, Spark in various ideas, whether it's uh, a Visual Studio Code or a Glass Studio. Um, thank you. 
Uh, another question. A previous speaker made some comments regarding provers having to work together to prove everything. How does it work in your experience? Do you use all three? One? So yes, uh, Spark is tailored to benefit the most from the combination of provers so that you have the least to do uh, in terms of uh, helping the prover. If you just limit yourself to one prover, it's just you're cutting yourself from uh, uh, two thirds of the automation. Uh, and so that's, that's just uh, a, a pain. And in fact, uh, what I did was to use the four provers that we have now. So there, there's one called Colibri, uh, which is not enabled by default because we're, we're still working with the developers for, for having a better integration. Uh, but it's, it's uh, inside the technology, you can enable it. So it, there's just a switch prover all to, uh, to have all, all four provers and here it's useful. So yes, uh, we use constantly, as soon as you have more complex proof, that go beyond basic uh, type safety. So even the, the proof that uh, Rod Chapman showed about more complex predicates and types, here uh, he needed the, the three provers, and, and here uh, I needed even the four provers that were not. Okay, thank you. Stefan uh, asks, how do you debug identify the issues when you write a complex contract and it fails during execution? Yeah, so here it, it didn't really apply because the way we use contracts for the runtime library is that we don't want these contracts to be executed. Uh, so we never execute them. We have a, a pragma assertion policy that we use uh, all over the runtime to say that uh, these contracts should never be executed. Uh, so these contracts are really here only for proof. Uh, and so if you uh, want to make sure that the precondition in particular are correct, you have to read them. Uh, and uh, uh, in general, when you develop contracts, uh, what you should uh, be careful about is that the, the contracts at the, at the border with the things that are not approved, typically the preconditions for library, for example, when you call it from elsewhere, if the, the code uh, that uses this library uh, is not proved, uh, the precondition could fail. So either it's a good thing because then you prevent uh, getting into uh, your uh, API with the wrong context, uh, or you don't want it to happen and then you have to test enough. Uh, and so, yeah, how, how do you... Um, uh, if, how do you uh, identify that uh, precondition, for example, is uh, wrong? Uh, well, here, uh, it, the, the failure in, in the test, for example, would give you a scenario which you can debug. And so in contracts in ADA or in Spark, or just like code, you can debug and test them. OK, thank you. We have um, about a minute. Uh, Frederick asks, did, you, did the proofs require a lot of GAST functions? Yes, so there, there was quite a lot of ghost functions, like I mentioned, but even more ghost lemmas. So things that you need to prove in isolation, because then the context is uh, smaller for proof. And I also wanted to uh, address one question, which is, uh, is it worth it? So that was the same question as for Rod. Uh, for us here, yes, uh, at least in terms of uh, making sure we are sufficiently uh, confident in, uh, in this runtime, to be seen if we can exploit that more generally in uh, in certification. So for here, I, I cannot say right now, for example, that we will benefit in certification from this proof compared to the traditional approach of specification and, and testing. Okay, so we have 10 seconds. Uh, there are questions that have not been answered. The room will now open and everybody is more than welcome to you. Thank you, Yannick. Thank you. I'll stay